Welcome back to part two of the opioid overdose uh, treatment video. So in part one, we talked a little bit about what opioids are, how they work, you know, which drugs do and don't qualify as opioids. Now we're going to get into really the point of the whole video, of the whole video series, which is treating an opioid overdose. How do we reverse it? How do we stop it? So I'm going to talk about agonists versus antagonists. We have agonist, and you may have heard that term. This is uh, something that causes the effect. So, for example, an opioid agonist would be morphine or codeine or hydrocodone or oxycodone or fentanyl or any of those. Those are all agonists. Then there are the antagonists, and I know a lot of this is going to be just review, but the antagonists are things that cancel out those effects. And as we spoke in the beginning about the different types of classes, we said that the three big antagonists for opioids are naloxone. Let me write these down. Naloxone, which is Narcan, same, uh, same drug there. Naltrexone, and Nalmaphene. And we also said that by far, the most common, the one you're going to see the most, is naloxone. Uh, I have yet to see an EMS agency that has naltrexone or nalmaphene in their protocols, and I don't even think I've been to an emergency department, to an ED, that gives naltrexone or nalmaphene. I'm sure it happens. I'm not saying that they're not used, but it's much less common than naloxone. Naloxone is kind of the standard when it comes to opioid antagonists. So what is an antagonist? Let's draw a sort of scale here. I'm going to draw this scale over here. And this is an imaginary scale. There isn't an actual scale like this in your body. But let's say that this is the opioid effects scale. I'm just making this up right now to kind of demonstrate a purpose. Opioid effect scale. So there's this imaginary scale, and here's 0% right in the middle. This is where probably most people are hanging out most of the time. Most people don't have opioids in their system at any given time, so most of those people are at 0%. Now up here, we'll call it 100%. And this is sort of arbitrary. Uh, I don't know that it's, there is such a thing as 100% opioid effect, but again, just, just go along with me here for the purpose of the illustration. So this would be the most opioid. This is all of those mu opioid receptors we talked about. All of them are saturated. Every single mu opioid receptor on every single cell that has them is bound to an opioid and you're getting the maximum effects. You're getting the maximum analgesia, the maximum sedation, the maximum respiratory depression. Well, on the other end is negative 100%. And I'm going to come back to that. We're going to explain a little more a little bit later. But before I do that, I want to go back to our illustration of the cell. So here's our classic basic cell with its nucleus and all of its organelles in here. And on the surface we have this enlarged cell surface receptor and we'll use the triangle uh, analogy or the triangle example here. So this is floating through, um, this, this is a cell in your body and we've got the We've got the opioids floating around, so let's take this green triangle. This is a, a classic opioid, so let's just call it morphine for our example. Oops, there we go. So this is morphine, and the morphine can come down into here, and it can bond right into here, or bind right into here, because it's got the right shape, it's the right type of chemical. It can bind in here, and it can cause the release of these chemicals that cause us opioid effects, right? So that's just review from the last, the last video. Now let me take all those away. The antagonists are part of the same class as the agonists. So I'm going to draw a different color, but still a triangle over here. And we'll say this is naloxone. This is Narcan. So an antagonist can also bind because it has the same chemical structure. It's still technically an opioid, even though we, we generally say antagonists are the opposite uh, of an opioid. Uh, an antagonist is still technically an opioid. The only difference is that when it binds, it does not cause the release of those chemicals that cause those effects. And that's just the real basic meat and potatoes about an antagonist. Now, there's a really important point here, and this is something that a lot of people don't know, and in fact, I didn't know until recently. But that's the fact that we have antagonists, antagonist, and we have what are called inverse 
antagonists. Now, they sound the same, right? It sounds like two ways of saying the same thing. A antagonist or inverse agonist. It's just, it's, it's semantics, right? Well, it turns out it's actually not. Here, let me go to red so I can highlight this point. They are not equal. They are not the same. An antagonist is not an inverse agonist. And to explain how they're not the same, let me come over here to our scale we drew earlier. And we'll say normally we're floating around at, at 0%. Now let's say I'm in some sort of, uh, maybe I'm in a car accident and I break my leg and I'm in a lot of pain and the pre-hospital providers, the paramedics, the EMTs get there and they decide they're going to give me some morphine. And so they bring me up, they give me some morphine and they bring me up here. I'm moving upwards on this scale to some point. Now, as we talked about, there is a point where you can have too much opioids. So I'm going to draw this threshold right here. And where that point is, is really going to depend on a lot of factors. It'll depend on the patient, on their metabolism, on any other medications or drugs they might have in their system. But let's just draw this arbitrary scale here. So let's say the paramedic uh, accidentally gives me too much morphine and I pass that threshold where it becomes dangerous. Now my respiratory depression is too severe, it's too profound. I'm becoming hypoxic. They're afraid I might become apneic. And now we're in a legitimate medical emergency where I might stop breathing and die. And so they say, we need to bring this person back down. And I'm going to go over it with this other color here, this green color, the same color I use for the morphine over here. I'm going to use that same color just to kind of demonstrate the drug. So I have this green morphine. It's bringing me up. Oops, they gave me too much. I've come too far. So now they're going to give me some naloxone to bring it back down. Let's see if I can find the same color I used earlier. I'm really bad about finding the right colors again. So they give me some naloxone to try and bring me back down below that threshold. Normally, when you're treating an opioid overdose, you don't want to get the patient back to 0%. It's too hard to try and shoot right for that 0%. So instead, all you're trying to do is to bring them below this, this danger threshold, this threshold where it becomes dangerous to have that much opioid. Once you get below that threshold, you're okay. And you know that you're below that threshold because of the respiratory depression. That's the big thing that worries us. So once my respiratory drive has improved and I've, I'm now breathing... Um, adequately on my own, breathing more than 12 times a minute, I'm maintaining good oxygen saturations. Now, we've gone far enough, we can stop, we don't need to go any further. And in a classic antagonist, it's nice because you can't go below zero. An antagonist will only bring you down to zero, a classic antagonist. It won't go any further than that. So in theory, if naloxone was just an antagonist, you could give someone as much naloxone as you wanted, and it would just bring them down to zero percent, and it would hold them at zero percent, and they'd be okay. The problem is that we said uh, an antagonist is not the same as an inverse agonist. An inverse agonist can bring you down to zero percent, and then it can keep going beyond 0% into these negative numbers. And just like up here, we have a threshold down here in the negative numbers where it starts to become dangerous. So what does it mean? What happens? Well, let me go back over here to the cell surface receptor. And when the inverse agonist binds, it doesn't cause the chemicals we talked about earlier that cause those opioid effects that cause analgesia, sedation, respiratory depression, meiosis, etc. But it does release other chemicals. It releases these other chemicals in here. And these chemicals cause a different set of effects. These are what we call the withdrawal symptoms. And we call them that because typically you see them when people are withdrawing from an opioid addiction. So the withdrawal symptoms for naloxone or for the opioids in general are things like hyper or hypotension. I should probably write these down too. Hyper or hypotension. So your blood pressure can go up or down. That's kind of unpredictable. Uh, other effects are tachycardia, so I'll put increased heart rate, agitation, and there's some also some much more serious effects. You can have uh, dyspnea or the difficulty breathing, diff breathing, and sort of the interesting thing is that with an opioid overdose, you can have that respiratory depression. Well, you can also have respiratory depression with an inverse agonist overdose. So even though we're on the other end of the scale, we can still have respiratory depression. And you can imagine how frustrating that would be as a provider, as a pre-hospital provider. You were trying to treat respiratory depression and you gave this drug, but if you give too much, you end up causing even more respiratory depression. Uh, subsequently, because of that, it can also cause hypoxia, and there are a whole host of other symptoms, uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, hallucination. Uh, this, these are just some of them. So that's the trouble we have with, with 
naloxone as an inverse agonist is we can overshoot. We call this overshooting. We go too far and we cause withdrawal symptoms. And you might just be causing uh, agitation, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which while they're not good for our patient, things that we can certainly manage and they're not life-threatening. Or you can cause things like hypotension, ventricular dysrhythmias, respiratory depression, hypoxia, which absolutely can be life-threatening or are life-threatening. And you can put this patient into just as bad a shape as they were before or even worse shape. Uh, we don't want to do any harm to our patients. So that's why it becomes really important to understand naloxone and to understand the dosing. There's one more side effect of an inverse agonist, an opioid inverse agonist, one more effect from overshooting that scale and ending up in the negative percents, the withdrawal symptoms. There's one more side effect I want to talk about, and I'm only going to briefly mention it because, frankly, I can make a whole video series on this right here, but that's called ARDS, A-R-D-S, which stands for Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. And in case you haven't heard of this, ARDS is a very dangerous symptom in patients that basically causes entire sections of the lung to just stop participating in gas exchange. So entire sections of your lung essentially just stop working. You might have, you might be an adult and have the physical lungs of an adult, but you only have a tiny little area that's actually exchanging gases, uh, oxygen and CO2. And ARDS is a very serious condition. It has very poor outcomes. Uh, some studies show that the Prognosis for ARDS has a mortality rate of up to 58%, meaning over half of patients who get ARDS die from it. The good news is that in opioid-related ARDS, it has a much better outcome as long as you identify it early and treat it early. And the other good news is that treatment really focuses on just basic airway and ventilation management. So if you see your patient, uh, if you've overshot and given them too much naloxone or given them the right amount of naloxone, but you've given it too quickly and you see your patient start going into ARDS, this would be you notice this by basically having increasing respiratory distress despite the fact that you're breathing for them and you're giving them naloxone. If they're still getting, it's getting worse, maybe they have poor compliance when you're bagging. And that's a big thing with ARDS is poor compliance. So you're trying to bag them, but you're having a hard time physically getting the air to go in. Poor compliance. You might also see decreasing uh, saturations, decreasing pulse ox. So if you see these things start to happen and you might start suspecting ARDS, all you have to do is just make sure you have really good airway and really good breathing for that patient. So maybe place some sort of uh, airway adjunct and breathe for them. And generally speaking, in the, the studies that they've done, patients who have opioid-related ARDS or opioid inverse agonist-related ARDS, they respond much better than most patients do. The, the mortality is much lower than in just regular ARDS. All right, so we've explained a lot of the nitty-gritty behind the antagonist or technically the inverse agonist. So we've talked a little bit about how they work in this made-up scale. So now let's talk about how to treat it. How are we actually going to treat opioid overdose with naloxone? Treatment, and I'll put specifically with naloxone. We're not going to talk about naltrexone or nalmaphene today. Treatment with naloxone. And I've got to pause right here and just give a quick disclaimer. These treatment options that I'm about to present are things that are based on sort of the general consensus in American medicine and, and even in international medicine. So as far as dosages and, and repeat frequencies, these are generally accepted. And if you look at the journals and the, the peer-reviewed uh, papers, they all kind of agree on more or less the same treatment. However, I am not your medical director, and I'm not authorized to tell you how to treat anyone, and you're not authorized to take my advice. So my suggestion to you would be look at these, understand that they are the standards out there, but make sure you then go and look at your own protocols and maybe even have a discussion with your medical director to ensure that what you've learned here are in line with what they're allowing you to do because they're the ones that allow you to do this. I know most of that goes without saying, but to cover myself, I have to make sure that I explicitly say, make sure you follow your own protocols and your own medical director. So we talked about patients who are in opioid overdose. Uh, if there's respiratory, de respiratory depression, then they are in danger of dying. They're at risk of dying. It is a very serious life-threatening issue. So you need to do something. And the treatment should center on airway and breathing management because that's typically the problem that opioids cause. They cause 
uh, respiratory depression, like we've said a thousand times already, and the patient can stop breathing, become hypoxic, and die from that. So that's re really where you want to focus your treatment. Let's put that here. We'll put focus on A and B, of course referring to ABCs. I'm not saying you're not going to focus on anything else. You're not going to look at other things. You're also, of course, going to look at circulation in your whole secondary assessment. But with naloxone, A and B are really where you're going to make your money. That's where you're going to have the most effect. When you go to give naloxone, there are a few different routes you can use. We've got IV, your classic intravenous route. We've got IM, so you can give it intramuscularly if you cannot get an IV for some reason. And you've got IN, which we don't see that abbreviation as much in EMS, so let me try to put here in parentheses, that's intranasal. And in case you're not familiar with the intranasal route, it's really, really easy. This is one thing I love about naloxone. There's a little device called a mucosal atomizer device, an MAD. And all it is is a little cone that fits on the end of your syringe and it converts the stream of liquid coming out of your syringe into a mist that can be absorbed by the mucosa in the nose. So you need a special little tool, but it's very easy to get. They're very small, very cheap. Um, you can throw it inside your medication kit or something else. Intranasal naloxone works extremely quickly. What's great about this is that all you have to do is take your syringe, you add the mat on the end of it, and you can administer it. You don't have to wait to start an IV. You don't have to, you know, get an alcohol prep and clean the site for an intramuscular injection and then get the right needle and attach it. It's just very, very quick and very easy. And as a matter of fact, we're now seeing more and more jurisdictions are approving first responders, whether they're BLS EMTs or even police officers, to carry intranasal naloxone and some places even allow laypersons to carry it so you know if you're working with an addiction counselor or something or you uh, are friends with people who have known addiction or family members of people with known opioid addiction then there are some places that will even allow you to carry intranasal um, naloxone so that in case you see someone having an overdose you can treat it it's a great tool I cannot recommend it enough and what's nice about all three doses uh, I'm sorry all three routes is that it's the same dose same dose for all routes. So you don't have to make any dose, uh, dose adjustments. So how much naloxone are we going to give and how often are we going to give it? It's going to depend on our patient's conditions. So we're going to extend this bullet point here, naloxone. So we're going to divide our patients into a, a couple groups here. So if we're going to be treating with naloxone, it has to be because the patient is not breathing adequately breathing inadequately. If they're breathing adequately, then we really shouldn't be giving naloxone because they're not far enough on that scale that I showed earlier to really merit treatment with an opioid antagonist. So we have to be concerned that they're not breathing adequately or that they are breathing inadequately. So there's two categories from here. We have patients who, they're not breathing adequately, but they are still breathing. We're just going to say less than 12 breaths per minute. And that's sort of the definition of inadequate here for what we're talking about is less than 12 breaths per minute. So they're not breathing adequately. They're breathing slower than 12, but they are still breathing. They're not totally apneic. So then the other category, of course, would be patients who are not breathing at all. They are apneic. No breathing at all. And the reason we are splitting these people into two groups is because we don't want to be too aggressive with the naloxone because then you risk overshooting and getting into the withdrawal symptoms. And so if they're breathing at least a little bit, we can be a little more conservative. And what the rec recommendations are to do here are to give doses of 0 0.05 milligrams uh, per dose. You're going to do that and you're going to titrate with about one minute in between per dose. And I'll put Q, which is every uh, Q one minute, every one minute. So 0 0.05 milligrams of naloxone every one minute. And we're going to stop giving it once they start breathing adequately again, once they are breathing above 12 per minute. Now, if they're apneic, we want to be a little more aggressive. So we're willing to slightly increase our risk of overshooting and, and hitting those withdrawal symptoms, even though we don't want to do that, but we're willing to accept a higher risk because the patient is apneic. They're in a much worse state. So here, we're going to kind of follow the same protocol, but with a higher dose, 0 0.2 all the way up to one milligram 
per dose. And again, exactly how much you give is going to depend on your protocols and your medical director, but the rest of the protocol is the same. We're giving, and either way, we're giving naloxone every minute until we get the effects we want. The only difference is how much we're giving every minute. So these are two categories. Now, some common questions that come up, how, how much are we going to give? At what point do we, do we worry that there's a problem? You know, let's say that I've given, um, I have an apneic patient, I've given them one milligram of, of naloxone, which is kind of the max amount per dose, and I've done that every 60 seconds, and I've now given four milligrams. I've done it four times, and the patient still isn't better. Can I keep going? Uh, the answer is technically yes. There's no... Um, there's no maximum safe dose, so you can keep giving it if you need to. However, if you're getting to like the 5 or even up to the 10 milligram ranges, you need to kind of stop and ask yourself, Am I make, did I make the right diagnosis? Is this really an opioid overdose? Because it should be responding to this no opioid antagonist or this opioid inverse agonist to the naloxone. And if I'm at 5 or 10 milligrams, it's not responding. So you're going to you're going to start checking things. If you're giving, giving it IV, is your IV patent? Is it working? Or is all that naloxone just sitting in the muscle somewhere because it was infiltrated? Um, if that's okay, then you're going to say, is there anything else that could be in, uh, causing this problem? It, am I measuring my dosages correctly? And if you're sure that everything else is being done correctly, you have to say, well, did I diagnose this correctly? Maybe it's not a naloxone overdose. In the first video, we talked about some other things that can mimic naloxone overdose. And so if you've given that much, you need to really consider that you might have given, um, you might be giving the wrong drug for the wrong diagnosis. And the last thing I want to talk about in this video is overshooting. So we, we mentioned overshooting quite a few times before. That's where you give too much naloxone. You push that patient into the negative side of that imaginary scale. And if you overshoot, you can cause, like we said, those other life-threatening withdrawal symptoms. So some people might think, oh, I've overshot. I've given too much. Uh, I'm getting a new slide here. I've given too much naloxone. So let's draw our scale again, our imaginary scale. Here's a zero point, there's a maximum 100%, there's a minimum minus 100%, plus 100. So you've got your patient who's right here, they're above that imaginary threshold for it being dangerous, and here's our imaginary threshold for the inverse agonist being dangerous. You give too much naloxone, and you bring your patient all the way down below this into this danger threshold. Some people think that, well, I should just give some opioid, like some morphine or some fentanyl, and just bring them back up and get them above zero and try and shoot to get in this range right here, this this good range we want to be in. That is a bad idea. I'm going to go ahead and erase those lines so that you don't think I'm recommending that. Do not do that. And the problem with this is I like to use the analogy of if you have a seesaw right here. So here's my seesaw. And I put a big elephant right here. I'm going to weigh my seesaw all the way down. The solution is not to put another elephant over here to try and balance it back out because all that's going to do is it's going to break the seesaw. It's just going to break it. It's not going to balance. It's going to break. And with the patient, you kind of run into the same issues where if they have an opioid overdose and then they get an opioid antagonist overdosed and now you try and give them more opioid, all you're going to do is you're going to break this metaphoric seesaw. So if you overshoot, do not try and cancel it out by giving more opioids. At that point, you just need to manage those withdrawal symptoms with other measures. Again, focusing on airway and breathing. The last thing to think about when you're giving an antagonist or an inverse agonist are duration of actions. So I'll just put duration. And this is how long that drug's going to keep working. So we have a, a little bit of a, I don't know if problem's the right word, but something to kind of keep in mind. That is that the duration of naloxone is just about one hour. And again, there are a lot of factors that can affect this, but uh, we'll call that just about one hour. So if you give someone naloxone, it's going to work for about an hour before it wears off. Most opioids, and there are a lot of opioids as we saw before, and they're all a little bit different, but most opioids have a duration of at least two hours. And many are even more than that. You know, many get up into the four, eight hour range. So as you can kind of see that the problem here is that if we give naloxone, it's going to work and it's going to bring that patient below that threshold up here for about an hour, but it's going to wear off in an hour. When that happens, there are still other opioids floating around in the patient's system. And so the patient's going to go right up into that danger zone again. So if you give a patient naloxone, you need to continue to monitor them for several hours.
uh, either that or transfer care to someone. And presumably if you're in pre-hospital, you're not going to sit with the patient for four plus hours, but transfer care. But either way, you need to monitor that patient because after about an hour, they might start slipping back into that opioid overdose and you need to be ready to treat it again with more antagonist, more inverse agonist if necessary. That concludes our second video and the, the second in the two-part series treatment of opioid overdose. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please go to our website. That's miglabs.com. And there's a, a link there where you can submit questions you may have, and, and I'll try and answer as many as I can. We also have the lesson outline for this lesson that has a PDF that fills in some of the gaps that I've surely left when I'm talking and a lot more information. So we hope you'll join us on the website and uh, I hope you'll tune into our next video. Thanks for watching.